welcome welcome back everyone after the break i hope everyone's feeling refreshed with some tea coffee water and some much appreciated welsh cakes of course as well um, my name's Asif Hussain. I'm from the Department of Heritage, Classics. Um, no, it's History, Heritage and Classics. Apologies for that. We've had so many name changes and we keep sort of, yeah, mixing things up. But that's where we are today. Um, and I'm going to be chairing this panel um, that sort of leads us into our lunch break partway through the day. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers, uh, Dr. Meg Goodluck, who is our Collections Access Manager. And today, Meg is going to be talking to us about the Hood legacy. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. So it's my pleasure to kick off this session celebrating the evolution of the Egypt Center collection um, rather than kind of the building and programming. So I'm going to be discussing the ongoing relationship between us here in Swansea and the truly remarkable family of the Reverend William Franklin Hood. All right. So like most Egypt Center stories, Like, like most Egypt Center stories, um, this one, of course, starts with Sir Henry Welcome, um, who we see here on the left. And, and then we see, of course, Kate Bosgriffis here on the right, um, amongst the early display of the Welcome Loan here in Swansea. So the material was sent at the whim of the Welcome Trust, and we didn't have the option to select items. So the objects that are here already are, they already have an air of coincidence. There was a series of specific events that brought them here to our door. So within the 92 crates of material that arrived in Swansea from the Welcome Trust, many different collectors were represented and they each have their own story. One of them was Reverend William Franklin Hood. So Hood's uh, perhaps best known for the so-called Hood Papyrus, which was an onomasticon. And it was not a welcome item. It was sold directly to the British Museum from his wife. Hood was described as the first Hood to become fascinated by ancient Egypt by his descendants. And he was initially sent abroad for his health in 1851. He returned several times over the next decade before succumbing to tuberculosis in 1864. There's no confirmed images of William Franklin Hood. The photo you see here is from the archives of the Prince of Wales, who's later King Edward VII, and he's this one here, sitting on the rock, um, and they're at Karnak. So this is dated to 1862, which is a year after Hood's last known trip to Egypt, um, and the archive identifies all of the individuals in the photo, but there's at least two other copies of this photo known, and they both have pencil annotations that put the Reverend and Mrs. Hood in this photo. Hood family resided at Nettleham Hall in Lincolnshire from the 1820s. After the death of William Franklin Hood at the age of 40, his father added a great hall to house his collection. So other than the papyrus that we've already seen that was sold to the British Museum, the family actually retained the rest of his massive um, collecting habits. And you can see several modern and ancient Egyptian elements in this photo, particularly if you look around the area of the fireplace. The house itself was destroyed in a fire in 1939. The circumstances are reported to be somewhat mysterious. Uh, one family record blames careless tenants, um, but today it's largely in abandoned ruins. Good news for us is that the Egyptian collection was no longer in the house at the time. It was actually sold at auction in 1924 due to financial difficulties. And as he was prone to do, Welcome purchased a number of lots through his agents. Uh, around 100 items from which ultimately found themselves here in the Egypt Center. 
Thanks. Those are some really exceptional pieces, um, including this lovely string of carnelian beads and snakehead pendants, as well as some really nicely preserved cartonnage pieces. And you can see all of these in our galleries today. Distribution of the Welcome Collection is notoriously haphazard, and the hood material makes a really good case study for this. So by addressing the dispersed material, links can start to be made, like the two coffin fragments that we've shown here. The ones in Swansea and ones in Liverpool, their iconography and color similarities are supported by the fact that they're both once owned by Hood. Furthermore, digging um, through the archives or the records shows that they were associated with the same welcome slip and they were even stored in the same crate and auctioned within the same lot. Stapis of Ptahhotep find themselves in a similar situation. So unlike many of the Shaktis in the Egypt Center collection now, Ptahhotep doesn't spend his days alone. There's actually 18 mummiform examples and two overseers down at the end. There we go. Two overseers down at the end to keep them in line. These appeared in the hood sale as lots 157 and lot 158. So Welcome clearly felt the need to own the whole set. Half wasn't quite enough. You might be noting here, though, that the description of the Shaptis actually takes up very little of the text. The, the focus is really on two Shapti boxes that are described in great detail. The boxes themselves are both in Birmingham. So the seeming incongruity of the division with the boxes sent to Birmingham and the Shaptis coming here to Swansea has long been an issue of discussion here and some speculation. Mm -hmm. um, the surely the more logical solution would have been to box them as one Shapti box, one overseer and nine mummiform as the original sets were intended. However, the increasing availability of wealth information online provided some intriguing insights. So the photo on the left shows the actual welcome display and both boxes appear in the bottom of the cabinet with their lids on and no associated shoptees. This suggests that the boxes and the figures have now been thoroughly disassociated. The shoptees were housed elsewhere in the mammoth collection and the boxes were on display. And thus it appears that the disenfranchisement of the shoptees from their boxes was long before the dispersal. That's a very brief introduction to the collection of Reverend William Franklin Hood that's here in the Egypt Center. Um, but we have a ton to talk about, so we're going to have to move on. Uh, next, we're going to move into some very recent museum history. So over the last few months, the Egypt Center has been researching and appraising a further 100 plus objects from the estate of the late Martin Sinclair Franklin Hood. This Franklin Hood is a renowned archeologist and he was director of the British School at Athens. One biography states that his name was almost synonymous with the site of Knossos, which is a tribute to his extensive contribution to the study of the region. Our relationship with his family actually started a couple of years earlier when one of his children reached out when she saw our entry for the Reverend William Franklin Hood on our uh, website. So that's likely how the Egypt Center became top of mind when it became time to deal with the estate. This is a very abbreviated version of the truly remarkable descendants of Reverend Hood. Um, and this is very much not a genealogy talk. And I can, in, uh, sorry, I included, or this contains only the people most relevant to what we're discussing today. Um, and I also don't include the living generations just for their own privacy. Um, I should also mention that I'm referring to the individuals by their full legal names as so many of the names are repeated throughout rather than the names that they might have preferred in life. I've also added a few signposts here for you uh, to keep you grounded throughout the rest of the presentation. So at the top, we of course have Reverend William Franklin Hood, and then it's marched through descent down to Martin Sinclair Franklin Hood. So Reverend Hood had both a son and a daughter, but as was with the times, the house and the collection was passed on to his son, Sinclair Franklin Hood. Rather than archaeology, Sinclair Franklin Hood's interests ran to the estate 
cricket and religion. Um, he, uh, interestingly, he seems to also belong to the same Masonic Association at Oxford as Oscar Wilde. Uh, so Sinclair Franklin Hood died relatively young at around 45, 46, leaving the estate to his wife, Grace Eleanor. It's assumed that the sale of the Egyptian collection took place under her care, likely due to financial difficulties. She herself had health concerns that forced her to winter in the Italian Riviera to escape the cold and damp of England. Uh, for a family renowned for academic achievements, Grace Eleanor was somewhat reluctant to formally educate her daughters, and she declined to send them to the newly established Women's College at Oxford, despite having a personal invitation. That brings us to the generation we're primarily discussing today. Sinclair Franklin and Grace Eleanor had two daughters followed by four sons. Three of the sons died in World War I, with the fourth submitting to the injuries he endured only 10 years later. The three women highlighted here in yellow played pivotal roles in the story, and we're gonna return to them momentarily. Oops, wrong button. Sorry about that. All right. So today's talk is primarily talking about the family descent, the right side of the screen. It's impossible to talk about the Hood family contributions to the archaeology of the Near East without touching on the Crowfoots. Grace Mary Hood, known as Molly, was the granddaughter of Reverend William Franklin Hood, and she was a textile expert who published on the tunic of Tutankhamun, as well as various topics around spinning and looms. She was also a keen botanist, known for documenting through photographs and line drawings, and she became close friends with Hilda Petrie due to the fact that William Flinders Petrie documented their family collection. Her husband, John Winter Crowfoot, had a distinguished career in the British colonial administration of Egypt and Sudan, working mostly in education-related posts, but he ultimately went on to become director of the Department of Antiquities in Sudan. So when John became director of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem in 1926, he and Molly were able to dedicate themselves full-time to archaeology and worked at sites such as Jerash and Samaria. Molly and John's four daughters were all born in Cairo or Khartoum and each participated in their excavations at some point. So their eldest daughter, Dorothy, is best known for receiving a Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Uh, but she also precisely recorded the mosaics of Jarash while she was still a teenager. Joan Crawford uh, was a lithics expert and worked on excavations with her parents, Garsteng, and others. She ultimately became cataloger of the ancient Egyptian collection at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and she had interest in pre-dynastic Egypt. Elizabeth continued her mother's work in textiles, including working on the EES excavations at Kasser Abreem. And finally, Diana Crowfoot was a geographer and married an archaeologist working in Arctic Canada. She continued to return to her birthplace of Sudan well into her 90s. Lots and lots of biographies available on this uh, family online, and they're all really fascinating. But now we're going to return to the lineage on the right side of the screen. So one thing we immediately noticed when we were addressing the recent material from Martin Sinclair Franklin Hood was that it seemed very familiar to us. As you can see here, this bead net from his estate on the left immediately provoked memories of two other sets of beaded Sons of Horus that are now in the Egypt Center, but were originally from the Reverend Hood collection. The history provided by the family was that selection of items came from Martin Sinclair's mother and tied back to the Reverend uh, Franklin Hood collection. Uh, however, we quickly noticed that several of the items exactly match the description in the 1924 sales catalog, and these items should have been long out of the family estate. Our initial thought was that it was perhaps lots that had been returned as unsold or uncollected after the sale, and then were passed down generationally. An annotated version of the sales catalog told us a much more interesting story. We came to find that a number of the lots were sold to Mrs. M. Hood. That's indeed Martin Sinclair's mother, Mrs. Martin Arthur Franklin Hood. Though her husband had died in 1919, five years before the sale, it appears that Frances Hood attended the auction and purchased a number of the lots. The reasons for this are unknown, 
Perhaps she wanted to preserve some of the family legacy for her young son, or perhaps she was sent there to the auction to drive up the bidding prices and just ended up with a couple of them in the end. These were all relatively small items. There's some really nice pieces within them. So the first lot she purchased was lot 128 and it was three pounds and 10 shillings. Within this, it contained, following the catalog entry, that we can see here, a watch bead with loop, the top of a mast in blue glazed fans, the head of Hathor in ivory. We have three of the five, quote, vase shaped beads in one in gilt um, that were listed. Uh, these are actually pomegranate or citula shaped, but I can see where they went for vase shaped in the um, original documentation. We have two of three figures of the children of Horus molded on a wooden core. Uh, these are also made of wax and they're quite delicate. So it's unsurprising that perhaps one of them hasn't survived the next hundred years. Um, three of quote, for four others um, in blue glazed. So again, referring to the children of Horus. The upper part of a figure of Thoth and two other fragments in gilt wood and seven bronze rings corroded. So the rings or uh, bracelets, uh, earrings, whatever you want to call them these days, um, they've been identified in a variety of way now. Um, they actually particularly struck us as we have over a dozen almost identical items currently in the jewelry case in the House of Life that can also be traced back to the original Hood collection. So he had many of these um, with him. A further three lots are attributed to the Mrs. M. Hood, 164, 166, and 169. Lot 164 contained a set of the Children of Horus, six other single figures of the same, we've identified five here, a winged scarab from a mummy, four others without the wings, four wings, and three pieces of bead network, all glazed in fans. Lot 166 was a single item described as the figure of a man holding a throwing stick. Though it's now been re-identified as a figurine of a tattooed woman holding a wand, it is to our knowledge the only known example of this type that holds a wand, and thus it remains rare and curious. Lot 169 falls into the category of Ushapti figures and reads only as seven others in blue glazed, various sizes. Uh, with over 30 Ushaptis from this collection fitting such a description, it's not possible to identify which one are these seven from the sale, but we do expect them to be within it. So there's actually several other objects tied to both Francis and the Reverend Hood that we haven't identified within specific lots, um, but we still have a lot to talk about. So next up, we have another series of items that came into the care of the Hoods via Martin Sinclair Franklin Hood's mother-in-law, Dr. Marjorie Simmons. While the acquisition history of these objects isn't as well established, it's likely that they were purchased in Egypt in the early 20th century. 23 years younger than her husband, Marjorie seems to have given up her career in radiology to join her husband's life of art and travel. Their daughter, Rachel, went on to study classics at Cambridge and excavated in Greece. So it's only logical that it, when it came time, her mother's souvenirs of the Grand Tour would have been passed down to her. These items are predominantly small portable pieces, typical of such traveler collections. However, you can see they're actually very nice examples, particularly the amulets and scarabs. The standout items of Marjorie's acquisitions are the three amulets you see here, which seem to form a set. So we have Isis, Nephthys, and a third female with a scarab atop her head, which is likely the primordial goddess, Iusus. The segment of the collection is rounded off by the Shapti of Asada Makhbet. These Shaptis were discovered in 1891 during the excavations of the priest of Amun Kash at Deobari. Surplus items like this were later sold at the Cairo Museum in the early 20th century, so that supports the dates of both the Simmons' travels and their purchases. Last but certainly not least, we have the items associated with Martin Sinclair Franklin Hood's aunt, Dorothy Agnes Hood, known as Dolly. 
Dolly seems to have spent a great deal of her life in the company of her mother or her sister, Molly, uh, who's legally Grace Mary, if you're looking, um, following along in the tree there. So Dolly is known to assisted in many of her sister's endeavors in medicine, botany. While Molly and John were living in Cairo, Dolly joined them there in Egypt as a volunteer nurse. And interestingly, their brother Ivo, a military chaplain, was also stationed there at the same time. So it was a bit of a family affair. So like the rest of her culturally inclined family um, who were, in addition to being soldiers, they were all very musical, um, keen sportsmen, obviously involved in the family antiquities collection. Um, so Dolly seems to have been a really talented painter and is credited with a series of watercolors featuring objects from their Egyptian collection. These would have certainly been produced before the sale of the collection in 1924. Both the date and the skill of the reproduction were immediately recognized because these are objects that we knew. So the lovely detailed broad collar here is actually our very own W889, a cartonnage piece that you can visit now in the House of Death. Similarly, the two smaller detail studies that you see here, for drama, uh, they're both found in the Egypt galleries today. The other items traveled further afield, but they're certainly recognizable to us. The lovely coal container depicted here now lives in the Brooklyn Museum. I'm really testing the limits of my slide flips here. <laughs> and so, uh, and then this deal here is now in Liverpool. The only painting we've yet to identify is this offering scene. Um, if you recognize it, particularly out there in the internet world, please let us know. Of all the amazing items from the recent Hood collection, these watercolors really captured our hearts here at the Egypt Center. And we recently had them made into window coverings for our upstairs foyer. So um, you will see them today during the wine reception. Otherwise, please come visit us at some point and check them out. So you can see the offering scene here, the collar here, and then the coal pot there. Okay, so that's where I'm going to wrap it up today. Um, we need to obviously continue our celebration of all things Egypt Center. So thank you for your participation. And thank you particularly to the Hood family, past and present, for sharing their passion for ancient Egypt with us here in Swansea.